Act 3. Scene. The editorial office of the People's Messenger. The entrance door is on the left-hand side of the back wall. On the right-hand side is another door with glass panels through which the printing room can be seen. Another door in the right-hand wall. In the middle of the room is a large table covered with papers, newspapers and books. In the foreground on the left, a window, before which stands a desk and a high stool. There are a couple of easy chairs by the table and other chairs standing along the wall. The room is dingy and uncomfortable. The furniture is old, the chairs stained and torn. In the printing room, the comp compositors are seen at work and a printer is working a hand press. Hofstad is sitting at the desk writing. Billing comes in from the right with Dr Stockman's manuscript in his hand. Well, I must say. Have you read it through? Yes, indeed I have. Don't you think the do doctor hits them pretty hard? Hard? Bless my soul, he's crushing every word, falls like, oh, how shall I put it? Oh, like the blow of a sledgehammer. Yes, but they are not the people tr to throw up the sponge at the first blow. It's true, and for that reason we must strike blow upon blow until the whole of this aristocracy tumbles to pieces. As I sat in there reading this, I almost seemed to see a revolution in being. Gosh, speak so that Asklaskan cannot hear you. Aslaskan is a chicken-hearted chap. A coward. There is nothing of the man in him. But this time you will insist on your, way, on your own way, won't you? You will put the doctor's article in. Yes. And if the mayor doesn't like it... That will be the devil of a nuisance. Well, fortunately we can turn the situation to good account, whatever happens. If the mayor will not fall in with the doctor's project, he will have all the small tradesmen down on him, the whole of the householders' association, and the rest of them. And if he does fall in with it, he will fall out with the wrong crowd of large shareholders in the baths, who up to now have been his most valuable supporters. Yes, because they will certainly have to fork out a pretty penny. Yes, you may be sure they will. And in this way, the ring will be broken up, you see. And then in every issue of the paper, we will enlighten the public on the mayor's incapability on one point and another, and make it clear that all the positions of trust in the town, the whole control of municipal affairs, ought to be put in the hands of the Liberals. That is perfectly true. I see it coming. I see it coming. We are on the threshold of a revolution. A knock is heard at the door. Gosh. Come in. Dr Stockman comes in by the street door. Hofstad goes to meet him. Ah, it is you, Doctor. Well? You may set to work and print it, Mr Hofstad. Has it come to that then? Hurrah! Yes, print away. Undoubtedly it has come to that. Now they must take what do they get. There is going to be a fight in the town, Mr Billing. Or to the knife, I hope. We will get our knives through their throats, Doctor. This article is only a beginning. I have already got four or five more sketched out in my head. Where is Aslaxon? Aslaxon just came here for a minute. Four or five more articles, did you say, on the same subject? No. Far from it, my dear fellow. No, they are about quite another matter. But they all spring from the question of the water supply and the drainage. One thing leads to another, you know. It's like beginning to pull down an old house, exactly. On my soul, it's true. You find you are not done till you've pulled all the old rubbish down. Pulled down? You're not thinking of pulling down the bath, surely, Doctor? Oh, far from it. Don't be afraid. No, and something quite different. Well, what do you think of my article, Mr. Hofstadt? I think it is simply a masterpiece. You really think so? Well, I am very pleased, very pleased. It is so clear and intelligible. One need have no special knowledge to understand the bearing of it. You'll have every enlightened man on your side. And every prudent man too, I hope. Prudent and the unprudent, almost the whole town. In that case, we may venture to print it. I should think so. We will put it in tomorrow morning. Of course. You must not lose a single day. What I wanted to ask you, Mr. Slaxon, was if you would supervise the printing of it yourself. With pleasure. Take care of it as if it were a treasure. No difference. Every word is important. I will look in again a little later. Perhaps you'll be able to let me see a proof. 
can't tell you how eager I am to see it in print and see it burst upon the public. Burst upon them? Yes, like a flash of lightning. Have it submitted to the judgment of my intelligent fellow townsmen. You cannot imagine what I've gone through today. I've been threatened first with one thing and then with another. They have tried to rob me of my most elementary rights as a man. What? Your rights as a man? They have tried to degrade me, to make a coward of me, to force me to put personal interests before my own most sacred convictions. Oh, that is too much. I'm damned if it isn't. No, you mustn't be surprised at anything from that quarter. Well, they will get the worst of it with me. They may assure themselves of that. I shall consider the people's messenger my sheet anchor now, and every single day I will bombard them with one article after another, like bombshells. Yes, but hurrah, it is war, it is war. I shall smite them to the ground. I shall crush them. I shall break down all their defenses before the eyes of the honest public. That is what I shall do. Yes, but in moderation, Doctor, proceed with moderation. Not a bit of it, not a bit of it. Don't spare the dynamite. Because it is not merely a question of water supply and drains now, you know. No, it is the whole of our social life that we have got to purify and disinfect. Spoken like a deliverer. All the incapables must be turned out, you understand. And that every walk of life. Endless vistas have opened themselves to my mind's eye today. I cannot see it all quite clearly yet, but I shall in time. Young and vigorous standard bearers, those are what we need and must seek, my friends. We must have new men in command at all our outposts. Here, here, here. We only need to stand by one another. It will be perfectly easy. The revolution will be launched like a ship that runs smoothly off the stocks. Don't you think? For my part, I think we, ha we have now a prospect of getting the municipal authority into the hands where it should lie. And if only we proceed with moderation, I cannot imagine that there will be any risk. Who the devil cares whether there is any risk or not? What I am doing, I am doing in the name of truth and for the sake of my conscience. You are a man who deserves to be supported, Doctor. Yes, there's no denying that the Doctor is a true friend to the town. A real friend to the community, that he is. Take my word for it, as Luxon. Dr. Stockman is a friend of the people. I fancy the Householders Association will make use of that expression before long. Thank you. Thank you, my dear staunch friends. It is very refreshing to me to hear you say that. My brother called me something quite different. Oh, by Jove, he shall have it back with interest. But now I must be off to see... I will come back, as I said. Keep a very careful eye on the manuscript as Slaskin, and don't for worlds leave out any of my notes of exclamation. Rather put one or two more in. Capital. Capital. Well, goodbye for the present. Goodbye. Goodbye. They show him to the door and bow him out. He may prove an invaluably, invaluably useful man to us. Yes, so long as he confines himself to the matter of the baths. But if he goes farther afield, I don't think it would be advisable to follow him. Mm. That all depends. He was so infernally timid as Laxton. Timid? Well, yes, when it is a question of the lo local authorities, I am timid, Mr. Billing. It is the lesson I have learned in the school of experience, let me tell you. But try me in higher politics. It matters that concern the government itself, and then see if I'm timid. No, you aren't. I admit. But this is simply contradicting yourself. <laughs> I'm a man with a conscience, and that is the whole matter. If you attack the government, you don't do the community any harm anyway. Those fellows pay no attention to attacks, you see. They go on just as they are, in spite of them. But local authorities are different. They can be turned out. And then perhaps you may get an ignorant lot in, into office who may do irreparable harm to the householders and everybody else. But what of the education of citizens by self-government? Don't you attach any importance to that? When a man has interests of his own to protect, he cannot think of everything, Mr. Hopstad. Then I hope I shall never have any interests of my own to protect. Here, here. Hmm. 
Mr. Sheriff Stensgard was your predecessor at that editorial desk. <laughs> Blah, that turncoat! I must have weather cock and never will be. A politician should never be too certain of anything, Mr. Hofstadt. And as for you, Mr. Billing, I should think it is time for you to be taking in a reef or two in your sails, seeing that you're applying for the post of secretary to the bench. I? Are you, Billing? Well, yes, but you must clearly understand I am only doing it to annoy the bigwigs. Anyhow, it is no business of mine. But if I am to be accused of timidity and of inconsistency in my principles, this is what I want to point out. My political past is an open book. I have never changed, except perhaps to become a little more moderate, you see. My heart is still with the people. But I don't deny that my reason has a certain bias towards the authorities. The local ones, I mean. Or shouldn't we try and get rid of him, Hofstad? Do you know anyone else who, who will advance the money for our paper and printing bill? It is an infernal nuisance that we don't possess some capital to trade on. Yes, if we, only we had had that, then... Suppose you were to apply to Dr Stockman. What's the use? He has got nothing. No, but he has got a warm man in the background. Old Morton Kill. The Badger, as they call him. Are you so sure he's got anything? Good Lord, of course he has, and some of it must come to the Stockmans. Most probably he will do something for the children, at all events. Are you counting on that? Counting on it? Of course I'm not counting on anything. That is right, and I should not count on the secretaryship to the bench either if I were you, for I can assure you, you won't get it. Do you think I'm not quite aware of that? My object is precisely not to get it. A slight of that kind stimulates a man's fighting power. It is like getting a supply of fresh bile. And I'm sure one needs that badly enough in a hole and corner place like this, where it is so seldom anything happens to stir one up. Quite so. Quite so. Ah, I shall be heard of yet now. I shall go and write the appeal to the Householders Association. He goes into the room on the right. Hmm. That's it, is it? A knock is heard. Come in. Petra comes in by the outer door. Hofstad gets up. What? You? Here? Yes, you must forgive me. Won't you sit down? Uh, no, thank you. I must go again in a moment. Have you come with a message for your, from your father by any chance? No, I have come of my own account. She takes a book out of her coat pocket. Here is the English story. Why have you brought it back? Because I'm not going to translate it. But you promised me faithfully. Yes, uh, but then I had not read it. I don't suppose you have read it either. No, you know quite well I don't understand English, but... Uh, quite so. That is why I wanted to tell you that you must find something else. You can't use this for the people's messenger. Why not? Because it conflicts with all your opinions. Oh, for that matter. You don't understand me. The burden of this story is that there is a supernatural power that looks after the so-called good people in this world and makes everything happen for the best in their case, while all the so-called bad people are punished. Well, but that is all right. That is just what our readers want. And are you going to be the one to give it to them? For myself, I do not believe a word of it. You know quite well that things do not happen so in reality. You are perfectly right. But an editor cannot always act as he would prefer. He is often obliged to bow to the wishes of the public in, in um, unimportant matters. Politics are the most important things in life, for a newspaper anyway. And if I want to carry my public with me on the path that leads, me, leads to liberty and progress, I must not frighten them away. If they find a moral tale of this sort in the serial at the bottom of the page, they will be all the more ready to read what is printed above it. They feel more secure, as it were. For shame. You would never go and set a snare like that for your readers. You are not a spider. Thank you for having such a good opinion of me. No, as a matter of fact, that is Billings' idea, not mine. Billings? Yes. Anyway, 
he propounded that theory here one day, and it is Billings uh, who is so anxious to have that story in the paper. I don't know anything about the book. But how can Billings, with his emancipated views... Oh, Billings is a many-sided man. He's applying for the post of secretary to the bench too, so I hear. I don't believe it. Mr Hofstad, how could he possibly bring himself to do such a thing? Ah, you must ask him that. I should never thought that thought it of him. No? Does it really surprise you so much? Yes. Or perhaps not altogether. Really, I, I don't quite know. We journalists are not worth, worth much, Miss Stockman. Do you really mean that? I think so sometimes. Yes. In the ordinary affairs of everyday life, perhaps I can understand that. But now, when you have taken a weighty matter in hand... This matter of your father's, you mean? Exactly. It seems to me that now you must feel that you are a man worth more than most. Yes. Today I do feel something of that sort. Of course you do, don't you? It is a splendid vocation you have chosen to smooth the way for the march of unappreciated truths and new and courageous lines of thought. If it were nothing more than because you stand fearlessly in the open and take up the cause of an injured man. Especially when the, that injured man is... I don't really know how to... When that man is so upright and so honest, you mean? Especially when he's your father, I meant. That. Yes, Petra. Miss Petra. Is it that? That is the first and foremost with you. Not the matter itself. Nor the, not the truth. Not my father's big, generous heart. Certainly. Of course, that too. No, thank you. You have betrayed yourself, Mr. Hofstadt. And now I shall never trust you again in anything. Can you really take it so amiss in me that this is mostly for your sake? What I am angry for with is what I am angry with you for is for not having been honest with my father. You talk to him as if the truth and the good of the community were what lay nearest to your heart. You have made fools of both my father and me. You are not the man you made yourself out to be, and that I shall never forgive you, never. You ought not to speak so bitterly, Miss Petra. Least of all now. Why not now, especially? Because your father cannot do without my help. Are you that sort of man too? For shame. Oh, no, I am not. This came upon me so unexpectedly. You must believe that. I know what to believe. Goodbye. As Laxon comes in from the printed room, Hot hurriedly and with an air of mystery. Damnation, Hofstad! Oh, this is awkward. There is the book. You must give it to someone else. She goes towards the door. But, Miss Stockman! Goodbye! She goes out. I say, uh, Mr Hofstad. Well, well, what is it? The mayor is outside in the printing room. The mayor, did you say? Yes, he wants to speak to you. He came in by the back door. Didn't want to be seen, you understand. What can he want? Wait a bit. I will go myself. He goes to the door of the printing room, opens it, bows and invites Peter Stockman in. Just see, Aslaskin, that no one... Quite so. He goes into the printing room. You did not expect to see me here, Mr Hofstadt? No, I confess I did not. You are very snug in here. Very nice indeed. Oh. And here I come without any notice to take up your time. By all means, Mr. Mayor, I'm at your service. But let me relieve you of your... He takes Stockman's hat and stick and puts them on a chair. Won't you sit down? Thank you. He sits down. I have had an extremely annoying experience today, Mr. Hofstadt. Really? Ah, well, I expect with all the various business you have to attend to. The medical officer of the Baths is responsible for what happens today. Indeed, the doctor. 
He has addressed a kind of report to the baths committee on the subject of certain supposed defects in the baths. Has he indeed? Yes. Has he not told you? I thought he said... Uh, yes, it is true he did mention something about... A slaxon comes in from the printing room. I ought to have that copy. Uh, mm, uh, there it is on the desk. Right. Uh, but look there. That is the thing I was speaking of. Yes, th that is the doctor's article, Mr. Mayor. Oh! Is that what you were speaking about? Yes, that is it. What do you think of it? Oh, I'm only a layman, and I've only taken a very cursory glance at it. But you are going to print it? I cannot very well refuse the distinguished man. I have nothing to do with editing the paper, Mr. Mayor. I understand. I merely print what is put into my hands. Quite so. And so I, I must... He moves off towards the printing room. No, but wait a minute, Mr. Slaxon. You will allow me, Mr. Hofstad. If you please, Mr. Mayor. You are a discreet and thoughtful man, Mr. Slaxon. I am delighted to hear you think so, sir. And a man of very considerable influence. Chiefly among the small tradesmen, sir. Well, small taxpayers are the majority here as everywhere else. That is true. And I've no doubt you know the general trend of opinion among them, don't you? Yes, I, I think I may say I do, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Well, since there is such a praiseworthy spirit of self-sacrifice among the less wealthy citizens of our town... What? Self-sacrifice? It is pleasing evidence of a public-spirited feeling. Extremely pleasing evidence. I might almost say I hardly expected it, but you have a closer knowledge of public opinion than I. But, but Mr. Mayor... And indeed, it is no small sacrifice that the town is going to make. The town? But I don't understand. Is it the baths? At a provisional estimate, the alterations that the medical officer asserts to be desirable would, to be desirable, will cost somewhere about £20,000. Uh, that is a lot of money, but... Uh... Of course, it will be necessary to raise a municipal loan. Surely you never mean that the town must pay. Do you mean that it must come out of the municipal funds? Out of the ill-filled pockets of the small tradesmen? Well, my dear Mr. Slaxon, where else is the money to come from? Well, the gentlemen who own the baths ought to provide that. The proprietors of the baths are not in a position to incur any further expense. Is that absolutely certain, Mr. Mayor? I have satisfied myself that it is so. If the town wants these very extensive alterations, it will have to pay for them. But, damn it all! I, I beg your pardon. I, this is quite another matter, Mr. Hofstad. It is indeed. The most fatal part of it is that we shall be obliged to shut the bars for a couple of years. Shut them? Shut them all together? For two years? Yes, the work will take as long as that, at least. I'm damned if we will stand that, Mr. Mayor. What are, what are we householders to live upon in the meantime? Well, unfortunately, that is an extremely difficult question to answer, Mistress Laxon. But what would you have us do? Do you suppose we shall have a single visitor in the town if we go about proclaiming that our water is polluted, that we are living over a plague spot, that the entire town... And the whole thing is merely imagination. With the best will in the world, I have not been able to come to any other conclusion. Well, then I must say it is absolutely unjustifiable, Dr. Stockman. I beg your pardon, Mr. Mayor. What you say is lamentably true, Mr. Slaxon. My brother has unfortunately always been a headstrong man. After this, do you mean to give him your support, Mr. Hofstad? Can you suppose for a moment that I... I have drawn up a short resume of the situation, as it appears, from a reasonable man's point of view. In it, I have indicated how certain possible defects might suitably be remedied without outrunning the resources of the Bath's committee. Have you got it with you, Mr. Mayor? Yes, I brought it with me in case you should... Uh... Good Lord, there he is! 
Who? My brother? Where? Where? He's just gone through the printing room. Oh, how unlucky. I don't want to meet him here, and I still have several things to speak to you about. Uh, go in there for the present. But I... But... Will I find Mr. Billing in there? Uh, quick, quick, Mr. May, he's just coming. Oh, yes, very well. But see that you get rid of him quickly. He goes out through the door on the right, which has Lask and opens for him and shuts after him. Pretend to be doing something, Aslaskin. He sits down and writes, as Aslaskin begins foraging among a heap of papers that are lying on the chair. Dr. Stockman comes in from the printing room. Ah, here I am again. He puts down his hat and stick. Already, Doctor? Hurry up with what we were speaking about, Aslaskin. We are very pressed for time today. No proof for me to see yet, I hear. You couldn't expect it yet, Doctor. No. No. But I am impatient, as you can understand. I shall not know of peace of mind until I see it in print. Hmm. It will take a good while yet, won't it, Aslaskin? Yes, I'm, I'm almost afraid it will. All right, my dear friend. I will come back. I do not mind coming back twice, if necessary. A matter of great importance. The wealth of the town at stake, it is no time to shirk trouble. He's just going, but stops and comes back. Look here, there is one more thing I want to speak to you about. Excuse me, but could it not wait till some other time? I can tell you in half a dozen words. It is only this. When my article is read tomorrow and it is realised that I have been quietly working the whole winter for the welfare of the town... Yes, but, Doctor... I know what you are going to say. You don't see how on earth it was any more than my duty. My obvious duty as a citizen. Of course it wasn't. I know that as well as you. But my fellow citizens, you know. All the good souls who think so highly of me. Yes, our townsfolk have had a very high opinion of you so far, Doctor. And that is just why I am afraid they... Well, this is the point. When this reaches them, especially the poorer classes, and sounds in their ears like a summons to take the town's affairs into their own hands for the future. Um, uh, doctor, I will conceal from you the fact. Ah, I, I knew there was something in the wind, but I won't hear of it if anything of that sort is being set on foot. Of what sort? Well, whatever it is. Whatever it is, a demonstration in my honour, or a banquet, or a subscription list for some presentation to me, whatever it is, you must promise me solemnly and faithfully to put a stop to it. You too, Mr. Aslaxon. Do you understand? You must forgive me, Doctor. But sooner or later, we must tell you the plain truth. He is interrupted by the entrance of Mrs. Stockman, who comes in from the street door. Just as I thought. You too, Mrs. Stockman? What on earth do you want here, Catherine? I should think you know very well what I want. Won't you sit down, or perhaps... No, thank you, don't trouble. And you must not be offended at my coming to fetch my husband. I am the mother of three children, you know. Nonsense. We know all about that. Well... One would not give you credit for much thought for your wife and children today. If you had had that, you would not have gone and dragged us all into misfortune. Are you out of your senses, Catherine? Because a man has a wife and children, is he not to be allowed to proclaim the truth? Is he not to be allowed to be an actively useful citizen? Is he not to be allowed to do a service to his native town? Yes, Thomas, in reason. Just what I say, moderation in everything. And that is why you wrung us, Mr. Hofstadt, in enticing my husband away from his home and making a dupe of him in all this. I am certainly making a dupe of no one. Making a dupe of me? Do you suppose I should allow myself to be duped? It is, what, it is just what you do. I know quite well you have more brains than anyone in the town, but you are extremely easily duped, Thomas. Please, do realise that he loses his post at the baths if you print what he has written. What? Look here, Doctor. 
just let them try. No, no, they will take good care not to. I've got a packed majority behind me, let me tell you. Yes, that is just the worst of it. You're having such a horrid thing behind you. Rubbish, Catherine. Go home and look after your house and leave me to look after the community. How can you be so afraid when I'm so confident and happy? Truth and the people will win the fight, you may be certain. I see the whole of the broad-minded middle class marching like a victorious army. What the deuce is that lying there? Good Lord. Um. Here we have the topmost pinnacle of authority. He takes the mayor's official hat carefully between his fingertips and holds it up in the air. The mayor's hat? And here is the staff of office, too. How in the name of all that's wonderful? Well, you see... Oh, I understand. He's been here trying to talk you over. <laughs> he made rather a mistake there. And as soon as he caught sight of me in the printing room... <laughs> did he run away, Mr. Slaxon? Uh, yes, he ran away, Doctor. Ran away without his stick or his fiddlesticks. Peter doesn't run away and leave his belongings behind him. But what the deuce have you done with him? Ah, in there, of course. Now, see, Catherine. Thomas, please don't. Don't be rash, Doctor. Dr. Stockman has put on the mayor's hat and taken his stick in his hand. He goes up to the door, opens it, and stands with his hand to his hat at the salute. Peter Stockman comes in, red with anger. Billing follows him. What does this tomfoolery mean? Be respectful, my good Peter. I am the chief authority in the town now. Really, Thomas? Give me my hat and stick. If you are chief constable, let me tell you that I am the mayor. I am the master of the whole town. Please understand. Take off my hat, I tell you. Remember, it is part of an official uniform. Do you think the newly awakened lion-hearted people are going to be frightened by an official hat? There is going to be a revolution in the town tomorrow, let me tell you. You thought you could turn me out, but now I shall turn you out, turn you out of all of your various offices. Do you think I cannot? Listen to me. I have triumphant social forces behind me. Hofstadt and Billing will thunder in the people's messenger, and Aslaxon will take the field at the head of the whole Householders' Association. On that I won't, Doctor. Of course you will. Uh, may I ask, then, if Mr. Hofstadt intends to join this agitation? No, Mr. Mayor. No, Mr. Hofstadt is not such a fool as to go and ruin his paper and himself for the sake of an imaginary grievance. What does this mean? You have, re you have represented your case in a false light, Doctor. Therefore, I am unable to give you my support. And after what the mayor was so kind as to tell me just now, I... False light! Leave that part of it to me. Only print my article. I'm quite capable of defending it. I'm not going to print it. I cannot and will not and dare not print it. Dare not? What nonsense! You are the editor, and an editor controls his paper, I suppose. No, it is the subscribers, Doctor. Fortunately, yes. It is public opinion, the enlightened public, householders and people of that kind. They control the newspapers. And I have all these influences against me. Yes, you have. It would mean the absolute ruin of the community if your article were to appear. Indeed. My hat and stick, if you please. Dr. Stockman takes off the hat and lays it on the table with the stick. Peter Stockman takes them up. Your authority as mayor has come to an untimely end. You have not got to the end yet. Then is it quite impossible for you to print my article in the People's Messenger? Quite impossible. Out of regard for your family as well. You need not concern yourself about his family, thank you, Mr. Hobstad. My hat and stick, if you please. Dr. Stockman takes off the hat and lays it on the table with the stick. Peter Stockman takes them up. Your authority as mayor has come to an untimely end. 
We have not got to the end yet. Then is it quite impossible for you to print my article in the People's Messenger? Quite impossible. Out of regard for your family as well. You need not concern yourself about his family, thank you, Mr. Hofstad. It will be sufficient for the guidance of the public if this appears. It is an official statement. May I trouble you? Certainly. I will see that it is printed. But not mine. Do you imagine that you can silence me and stifle the truth? You will not find it so easy as you suppose, Mr. S. Laxon. Kindly take my manuscript at once and print it as a pamphlet. I will have 400 copies. No, five or 600. If you offered me its weight in gold, I could not lend my press for any such purpose, Doctor. It will be flying in the face of public opinion. You will not get it printed anywhere in the town. Then give it me back. Here it is. It shall be made public all the same. I will read it out at a mass meeting of the townspeople. All my citizens shall hear the voice of truth. You will not find any public body in the town, but will give you the use of their hall for such a purpose. Not a single one, I am certain. No, I'm damned if you will find one. But this is too shameful. Why should everyone turn against you like that? I will tell you why. It is because all the men in this town are old women. Like you. They all think of nothing but their families and never of the community. Then I will show them that an old woman can be a man for once. I am going to stand by you, Thomas. Bravely said, Catherine. It shall be made public, as I am a living soul. If I can't hire a hall, I shall hire a drum and parade the town with it and read it at every street corner. You're surely not such an errant fool as that. Yes, I am. You won't find a single man in the whole town to go with you. No, I'm damned if you will. Don't give in, Thomas. I will tell the boys to go with you. Oh, that is a splendid idea. Morton will be delighted, and Eilif will do whatever he does. Yes, and Petra, and you too, Catherine. No, I won't do that, but I will stand at the window and watch you. That's what I will do. Thank you, my dear. Now you and I are going to try a fall, my fine gentleman. I'm going to see whether a pack of cowards can succeed in gagging a patriot who wants to purify society. He and his wife go out by the street door. <sighs> now he has sent her out of her senses too. End of act.